I want to start by asking you something about globalization because we talk a lot about globalization and multiculturalism today but I think that uh, cosmopolitanism is a little bit different from those two concepts in the sense that it's a vision some would say a utopian vision of world citizenship world peace and human rights but so how do you see cosmopolitanism in the world today with, with all of its apparently endemic terrible conflicts and intractable well, um, I do think that uh, I understand cosmopolitanism as an ideal, as a utopia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and what I would say is that uh, um, I, I think it's also very closely related to globalization. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean by that is that um, uh, until we can begin to talk about the independences across the globe in a kind of planetary way, in which more or less everybody is sort of, you know, is in the stream of history and connected to one another. Utopianism, uh, cosmopolitanism is a very, very limited concept because it means really the capacity to move around uh, in a, within a very limited circle. Okay? But once the planet is one, then there is the possibility of global citizenship, of uh, universalism becomes potentially possible. Right. But the form which globalization has taken, which this interconnectedness has taken, is of course exactly the opposite. Uh, it connects disjunctive histories, you know, the, the very early and the very late, the too late, the too early, and the developed and the developing and the underdeveloped, the co colonized and the colonial, the pre-colonized and the post-colonized. These so whereas we speak as if there is one space and one globe and therefore potentially one citizenship and a kind of universal human uh, morality, the reality is precisely the, 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 the reverse. Not that the interdependencies don't constitute something new. I think they constitute a profoundly new historical moment. They constitute the moment when such a universal vision is actually practically potentially possible. Right. But the reality is exactly the opposite. The interconnectedness has been made you know, as a structure of power, as a structure of global power, and therefore of conflict, and therefore the differences are uh, overriding the interconnectedness. So I see globalization as opening these two quite different possibilities, the possibility of a world driven either into uh, warring differences, which is one of the possibilities, or driven into an overriding sameness and homogenization <laughs> under the aegis of one of those things mm. claiming the whole of civilization. Mm. So, you know, cosmopolitanism raises for me this double perspective. Mm. I mean, what you're saying about inequalities uh, is also linked to the fact that we live in a world of massive transnational movements of uh, refugees and economic migrants uh, from one place to another. And, and the next question I was going to ask you has to do with diasporas, because diasporas are, have always been seen as diasporas as the archetypal boundary crossing st strangers. And in that sense, they, they are thought to epitomize cosmopolitanism. But on the other hand, diasporas have also been accused of disloyalty to the nation, of not being rooted anywhere, of having no commitments, and even in these days of long distance nationalism without responsibility. Yes. Benedict Anderson put it, where they support, you know, guns for the IRA, they support uh, Jewish settlers on the West Bank or Hindu nationalists. So, so how do you see the role of diasporas in this globalized, cosmopolitanizing world, perhaps? This is what, what a huge question you're yeah. putting to. I mean, first of all, uh, um, before you get to diasporas, I would say, that uh, uh, given the uh, given the conflicting uh, picture of uh, of globalization that I, I just talked about, I would see the trans the enormous tr tide of transnational movements for various reasons. You know, driven by civil war and ethnic cleansing and famine and ecological disaster and economic search for economic benefits. Uh, you know. Whatever is this tide of peoples and movements across the world, I call this globalization from below. 
I think it is linked with the systems of inequalities and power that we talked about before. Yes. And I think there are, just to put it quickly, that, that there are two ways of life associated with this. There's therefore a cosmopolitanism of the above. You know, uh, global entrepreneurs who you know can't tell which airport they're in because they all look the same. You know, and who have a house in the on the Mediterranean. You know, you know what I mean. The, there is a kind of global co cosmopolitanism there, and then people, you know, driven across or f being obliged to uproot themselves and go across borders and live in camps and climb on the bottom of trains and airplanes and so on. Both of them are, are forms of globalization. But, but does, yeah. does cosmopolitanism have to be an elite thing? Can you have weapon no, no, class No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that other thing enforces the cosmopolitanism of the below because these mm. people have to become cosmopolitan. They have to learn mm. to live in two cultures and learn another language and make a life in another place. They have the same cosmopolitan skills as the entrepreneur requires in order to mm. understand markets in different parts of the world. They have to understand markets too, illegal markets, black market, whatever it is. But they are in translation, they're living in translation every day of their lives. So there is the cosmopolitan, that's what I call vernacular cosmopolitanism. Right, right, yes, it's right. a cosmopolitanism of not uh, not wanting the global life as a as a form of a, a you know of a, a reward for your status or wealth, but having to live the global life as one of the necessities of mm. the of, of what of the disjunctures of globalization. Okay, and that means that uh, um, uh, that uh, these these new settlements. Uh, as a consequence of globalization from below, are of course often diasporas because mm -hmm. they're people who are not necessarily made up their minds to go and live somewhere else forever, but they've been obliged for economic necessity or whatever is the reason to go somewhere else. The question then is what is their, you know, what is their position? What is their position in relation to the places they find themselves in? What is their relation to the, to the places that they came from? And what sense do they make of that? Which is another way of, of speaking of identity. I mean, this is, this is the, I've written about that. This is the identity question I'm interested in. Yes? Right. What, how do you make sense of yourself and of your life if this movement between places, cultures, religions, languages, civilizations, histories, times, is your lived reality? What, 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 can, what can you say this is, how can you say this is me and what on earth do you mean? And I think that in many ways, what I tried to say about identity, you know, I don't think identity is just free-floating smorgasbord, you know, you can get up today and decide to be whatever you like, I mean, that's rubbish, you know. It's tied to histories, it's tied to time, it's tied to narratives, it's tied to ideologies, you know, you can't just move around like that. But on the other hand, I think it isn't inscribed in your genes. Yeah, so, so it is a question. In that sense, I think it's a kind of open question. However, the disjuncture between globalization from above and below, however it is resolved, will affect what happens in the diasporas. Right. If, uh, I mean, if the, the, the attempt to homogenize the world globally, either militarily or industrially or economically or you know, civilizationally, principally civilization, if that wins out, then, of course, either you join that, assimilation, which is what they're offering now these days, social cohesion, look like us, learn our languages, learn our histories, become like us, or you're driven into the exact opposite, which is to defend yourself against right. that, and the retreat back to where you came from, as if that has remained the same. And either of those options is not really in a way cosmopolitan. Is no, it? of course, these are both are the retreat for, or they are the retreat from cosmopolitanism. Right. Because the first, you're only cosmopolitan if you look like one. We're all the same because we all look the same. Right. The other is we're all completely different from right. one another, and the right. barriers between the differences are un unpassable, and they're uh, you know they become more and more rigid. They become more and more exclusive. They become more and more punitive. We start to patrol those boundaries, regulate the the cultural mix between them, etc. Mm -hmm. So you know that has uh, and. People who sometimes quote me on identity forget that I've always talked about the possibility 
if we don't move towards the more open horizon cosmopolitanism from below, we will find ourselves driven either to homogenization from above or to the barrier of all against, the war of all against all. And you've in a way set a kind of aspiration for all of us in your work uh, in reaching out and recognizing both difference and the battle for equality as simultaneous yes. struggles. Yes. So, and you, you've come to England from far away and colonized this country. That's kind of you. I yeah. wish I had. <laughs> so the question is, do you feel yourself to be a cosmopolitan? You know, you hear me hesitate every time I use the word. You know why? Because a certain view of cosmopolitanism was built into the Enlightenment. Right. You know, uh, it's Kant's you know, famous phrase, what is Enlightenment? You know, and Kant is the architect of a certain version of cosmopolitanism. Right. And I resist that kind of cosmopolitanism, not because there weren't enlarging elements in it, of course there were, universalizing elements in it, but as we know very well, it is a very version of cosmopolitanism which became harnessed back to the, the West, to the, yeah, to the Western. Yeah. We were the enlightened ones, and we were going to enlighten everybody else. You know? This is the, this is, uh, the, the uh, paradox at the heart of the Enlightenment. All the good things, you know, I'm a child of the Enlightenment in the sense I believe in history and in progress, I'm not religious, you know, I believe in the rule of law, etc. But I'm not a child of the Enlightenment in the sense that everybody else is the childhood of mankind and only the Western civilization really are the grown-ups, mm -hmm. which is what Locke believed, and it's what Hegel believed, and it's what, you know, to what the Enlightenment thought. Really, really they thought that. And people who want to defend the Enlightenment, and I think in these days I feel myself recruited to their side, but I have to remind them they never understood difference. They never understood, they had a Western conception of reason. You know, they, they never understood the underbelly, the, the supporting ideological underpinnings of this particular notion of cosmopolitanism. So if you if you were to ask me if I'm a cosmopolitan, I'm not a cosmopolitanism in that sense. Right. Okay, uh, uh, But I am in the sense that I have never found myself in the position of being tied into the notion of the nation and nationhood as the ultimate end of the political process. Right. I know the tremendous value that the idea of nationhood played in the moment of decolonization. You know, it was what, in a sense, enabled us to liberate ourselves from imperialism, mm -hmm. from the old style of colonialism. So I can't undervalue that moment, but I see the everywhere the limits of nationhood as the all-encompassing point of identification. Mm -hmm. And it just happens that in my history, you know, I've sort of evaded it, <laughs> mm -hmm. because I left the Caribbean at the moment of decolonization. So I'm not a part of, I mean, in some sense I regret, of course, every, every diaspora has its regrets, you know, because although you can never go back to the past, you do have a sense of loss. There is, a, there is something you've lost, a kind mm -hmm. of intimate connection with landscape and family and tradition which you lose and we, I think this is the fate of modern people we have to lose them but we're going to go back to them so in my history as it happens you know my generation stayed at home and got deeply involved in writing the history of the nation okay? mm. and I wasn't there <laughs> no yeah. I was watching it from afar right so I wasn't I'm not enclosed in that so I see now the limits of that right. Right. And I look back at the Caribbean and I see that they cannot move any further within the framework of the nation. Indeed, within the framework of the nation, they are being driven by global forces which they don't have any leverage on. Right. And I came to England, I couldn't be a, I yeah. couldn't be a member of this one either because I was already deracinated from it, you know, although I've chosen to live here and marry into it and so on. I, I'm not a you know, part of the conception of the nation like that. Mm. So I'm a cosmopolitan by default, you might right, say. Right, like, yeah, like many of us. I have to find my way amongst, like many of us, amongst many attachments, many identification, none of them whole. I have to recognize how limited <coughs> that is. And I have to 
I've tried to maintain what I would call the openness of the horizon to that which I am not. You know, the experiences mm. I have not had. Because yeah. uh, yeah, that's really, you know, if, if this is a global moment, there's so many experiences we know nothing about. Mm. So yeah. we can't close it up around even our own histories, even if they're cosmopolitan, there are cosmopolitan worlds still to uncover. So it's the horizon towards the, towards, I don't want to make a fetish of otherness, you know, but it's around towards that point where we, our experience, our history ends and another history begins, which is adjunct to us, it, it overlaps with us, we've had, we know part of it, you know, I think of Palestine, yes, because, you know, uh, though I've never written extensively about it, you know, my, uh, it has been at the center of my political world for many, many years, partly mm. through my friendship with Edward Said and so on. You know, I just think that it is, it's one of the ones I can't let go of. You know? mm -hmm. I don't know it, I've never been to it. You know, I look at these pictures, I look at these people on the television, I look at Edward's uh, and Jean, Jean Moore's book, you know, Open, After an Open Sky, you know, I think I know these people, they're not my people, uh, but I know them, I ought to know them better, I, I know their experience, I know what it's like to be colonised, to be occupied by another place, you know, I know what it's like not to be in your home, to see your home across a barrier, you know, so I share so much of them, but they come from another tradition, another world, mm -hmm. another religious universe, another language, another literature. You know, so, you know, they're not me, but I'm open in some ways to their existing now in my global world. They are part mm -hmm. of my global right. world. You know, you talked about um, the people you grew up with who became the inscribers of the nation in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Do you think you could be a, a cosmopolitan at home, say in Africa or the Caribbean? Do you, or do you have to be locked into that n national vision, or are you, can you also be a cosmopolitan in your own country in some way? That is a very hard question, and I'm not a good person to answer it. Mm -hmm. The reason is because the Caribbean is by definition cosmopolitan. Right. You know, the original peoples don't exist yeah. in London. <laughs> so everybody who was there came from somewhere else. Right. The British, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the, 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 the Africans, everybody comes from somewhere else. Okay, so you're sort of a natural cosmopolitan. Right. There. there are some places you know? like that. And the very distinctiveness of Caribbean Creole culture, what is really indigenously Caribbean, is itself the mix. That is what is Right, about it. Right. This is different from asking the question about you know people from Africa, say. Yeah. You know, if you come from a West or East African country, colonization you know impacted on a, on your country and deconstructed it and reconstructed mm. something else. In what sense can you be? Can you remain at home and become and be a cosmopolitan? I think that is more difficult. But I think if you understand your history. And if you don't have, uh, you know, some, um, if you don't have some originary conception of your own culture as really always the same, you know, has been throbbing away there since the tribal past, uh, went underground during colonialism, is now coming back just as it was. If you don't have that conception of history, you see the degree to which who you are now and what your society is. It has been made and remade and is being remade again by forces which are essentially global, which are outside of you in some fundamental way. Mm. But I think this is a different kind of cosmopolitanism yeah. from the one which is available to you and me, right. you know, who have made, who have travelled to different. We've been obliged to think ourselves yeah. as different, and we can't have an original conception of culture because we know our own cultural being has changed, has been transformed historically, right. and we see our people like us being transformed by the new experience. So we are bound to have that. So I think mm. that you know, for an anthropologist, my question is, uh, other than two or three different conceptions of culture. Mm, yes. Yeah, you know, uh, or, or uh, uh, is it that, is it that, you know, is what I'm trying to say right, namely that culture is always <coughs> open and the, the real question is, is a balance. Yeah? Cultures which have remained pretty steady, 
which have not had to absorb large numbers of people. They've been influenced by and shaped by the outside too. <laughs> so there aren't, they aren't self-sufficient. Mm. But of course their sense of movement and of otherness and difference is bound to be more limited. They have a more limited space to operate in from those of us who either come like me, come from a, an already, di- I mean I'm twice diaspora, that mm. come from what is in fact a diaspora mm. creolized mm. culture. Yeah, so it's easy for me to take on but I don't know about But I mean, as one um, anthropologist, I'd say that people, say in Africa, have, have already had a journey. Yes. Away from that yes. theoretically yes. closed culture, which it may or may not have one, yes. once existed, yes. Yes. so that they've already been on a journey. And part of that journey that they've been on, especially I suppose the elite, but even the labor migrants who went to the yes. city to yes. work yes. or yes. Yeah. whatever, and part of that journey has been the making of the nation. Yeah. And it's within that yeah. national contours that one has to consider whether you are yes. a cosmopolitan or not. I yeah. mean, that would be yeah. the question. That if yeah. you are an African el- member of an elite, yeah. are you going to be a, a person who just embraces external globalization yeah. or, yeah. or yeah. espouses national homogenization? Yeah. Or are you going to be somebody who believes yeah, in yeah. this kind of openness, maybe yeah, the Kantian enlightenment, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, would, I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, I like that uh, way of thinking about it. That's sort of, that's a better way of putting it than I was trying to say when I said, mm. you know, they've already been remade no. <laughs> by many fools. They're already part of a cosmopolitanizing process. Uh, so really, it's, it's more a question of, not not ideology as such, but but of how the culture understands itself. Right. You know yes, whether it understands whether whether there is some impulsion to understand itself as an originary one to which the only really cultural pro- progress can be back towards the the original. Right. Yeah? Or whether it understands itself as inevitably open and then is working to try to strike the balance between what needs to change and what can be let in and let in on what terms and so on. Exactly, yeah. And that, I think, is, in a sense, that is the big cultural question, which is, as soon as the globe sort of becomes one, uh, but is one not because it's all the same, but it's one because it's all different, that is exactly the question of what happens at at these porous borders between cultures and peoples and histories. Mm. I mean, the other side of thinking about whether you can be a cosmopolitan in your own country is, can you be a cosmopolitan if you don't have commitments to a place or people or or, or maybe even culture? I don't know. Is it possible to be a cosmopolitan without these this rootedness somewhere? Well, I would have said not. You know, so and I think uh, I think the, the, I'm afraid of the word because I think it sort of suggests that. Right, you know? right. It sort of invokes a kind of cultureless, uh, rootedless, <laughs> you right. know, uh, uh, image of a person who's kind of floating, free floating, sampling all the cultures. You know, like uh, 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 well, my 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 entrepreneur, my global entrepreneur in in the in the first class. <laughs> waiting room of some airport is a good idea, you know. They love, you know, a bit of Japanese cooking and a bit of Indian cooking here, you know, and the French mm. cuisine there. They sample all of them, but, but none comes from an attachment to a particular way of handling food, you know, etc. Right. That doesn't mean you need to eat that way all the time, but you sort of know what it is like to be right. attached. Yeah. I think without that, uh, 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 the old you know, the old Marxist jive, rootless cosmopolitanism, right. <laughs> has some substance to it, you yeah, know, yeah. free-floating, you know, uh, and mm. uh, I think in many ways, this is here, here we encounter a, a, an interesting interface, there is a sort of interface with one aspect of liberalism, mm. which exactly thinks we can only really calculate what individuals are like when we free them from all their attachments. Right. No right. religion, no culture, nothing. Free floating atoms contracting with other free floating atoms, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, I think this is exactly one of the limitations of liberalism. Mm-hmm. You know, it's never understood culture. Not, not it's never sunk itself into culture, but it's never understood culture. It's never understood that its own 
you know, th this idea of the atomized individual has, of course, played its role. You know, the notion of the rule of law depends on a certain abstraction from cultures and particularities. Mm -hmm. so, so it does it does have its value, but it's never understood that it is always underpinned by its own culture. Mm -hmm. you know? No, there's no liberal democracy which doesn't have roots in. Yeah, in a, I suppose you always in, the, in in a in a community. Right. So you always start your struggles if they may be called cosmopolitan struggles from a particular yeah. location. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I believe in that. You know, in locatedness, in position, attachment. But I believe in, in I believe that those are rarely singular. Mm. Yeah? I don't think they kind of overlap. That the attachment to community is the same as the attachment to culture is the I same. See, yeah? Yeah. And I don't think that uh, I think that all of that has to be aware of its limits. Right, that's important. Uh, and there's one there's one question that I've been thinking about, and I wanted to ask what you think. I mean, there's a tendency to see cosmopolitans as individual travellers who move around and, as you say, in a way, ta have familiarity with different cultures yes, or different yes, tastes. Yes. But, but maybe cosmopolitanism is really a collective phenomenon. It's a coming together of people from many different places, potentially, to create something new, maybe even a new culture. Yes. So I wonder whether what you how you would respond to that question. Is, is the cosmopolitan really an individual or is it something that's created by a, a sort of bunch of individuals like your, the people in your... No, I, I mean, I, I think of it as, a, as, a, as more of a collective phenomenon. You know, when mm. I'm interested in, in certain parts of the world, mm. probably in an earlier period, mm. really the cosmopolitanism of trade a lot of those places are in the Middle East, yeah. uh, you know, because such a confluence of Europe and, and, and the East and so on, and the South. Uh, and, you know, places like that, uh, I think, are extremely interesting, in which uh, the cultures don't merge into creating something entirely new. Yes. But it's known as a place in which many cultures and many friendships and marriages across cultural lines are, you know. So it's known as a place where there are many cultures going on. Uh, very often it's not, it doesn't, it's not uh, driven by, uh, um, uh, you know, by the harsh disciplines of a labour market of people without work searching for work. So really, markets, but of a more <laughs> local kind, if yes. you understand what I mean. Yeah? Right. Uh, not the market as a, as a capital, capitalist abstraction, Wall but Street. markets and trade. You know, trade is, people follow the roots of trade, you know. Mm. And I think these are really interesting places to think about. Mm. Uh, and people who are attached to them, uh, they don't often last a long time, but people who are attached to them, I mean, Tav Ghosh has written about mm, it, you know. Yes, people yes. talk about Beirut and Lebanon as one, uh, at one time as a place like that. They talk about the Eastern Mediterranean like that and North mm. Africa, you know, places where, and, and they have often been places where these differences are tolerated. They're not places of race riots and of ethnic cleansing and of mm. religious conversion, you know. People had different religions, so they, they had their attachments, they had their attachments to ways of life, they had their distinct family traditions and so on, but they were not um, evangelizing. Right. Yeah, yes, they were not trying to recruit people to, right. you know, they didn't feel that there was a sort of tussle, there's not a crusading vision of you must be like me, you must give up what you think and be like me. And these are and these are just, you know, these are utopian spots for me. You know, there's a whole history there. Yeah. But as a place, if I took you into it as a place, you you would have to call it cosmopolitan because, yeah. you know, I, you know, I lie beside the man who is trying to teach me Russian. He doesn't have a single word of English. You know? yeah. I said, that's for Daniel. I was <laughs> so thrilled when I tell him that when he's going home. He's teaching the nurses thing. They're teaching him. He says to her, what are you, what are you teaching me? Tagalog. 
<laughs> of course. Which is, you know, yeah. what they speak in the Philippines. You know, so I think this man who's trying desperately to learn English, meanwhile holding on, uh, you know, as an Azerbaijani to Russian, which he speaks to the Polish woman who is cleaning the ward and trying to teach this Filipino nurse who is teaching him Tagalog. Well, this is a pretty, you know, yeah. so maybe <laughs> polyglot are. place. <laughs> cosmopolitan sites like little islands yeah. in the middle of this yeah. country well, that we live I mean. in. You know, I think of them often as sites rather than, it's hard to think of them with a polity and yeah. you know, a, a structure like that, but it's as social sites, kind of happening. places which have historically come together. I right. think uh, I think there are many. And one of them is British hospitals yeah, in the 21st British century. Hospitals. century. Yes. Right. I mean, I have one final question uh, to you, which it's a kind of serious question, I think, but it's a, you know one that there isn't a clear answer to at the moment, which is, do you think we should uh, impose cosmopolitan values on other peoples or places? Should we be, sort of impose human rights or democracy? Can we impose them? I mean, it seems a very difficult question to me. Very difficult question. Very difficult question. Um, uh, you know, I think the uh, uh, first of all, I, I don't, I, I don't know that I would use cosmopolitanism in that way interchangeably with democracy and human rights. You know, I know that they belong to a kind of common frame, yeah, mm. but I would, I think democracy is being imposed, um, you know, al almost as part of a part of a new imperial or near-imperial system. The more it's hollowed out in so-called democracies, the more everybody else is required to have it. Yeah. And people, you know, in Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, who, you know, will take a long time to develop a democratic culture which can underpin, you know, liberal democratic institutions, they're required to have it, you know, overnight because the Americans need to leave behind a stable state and get out, you know, for political... Do you understand what I mean? So, yes. You know, I, don't know, I don't know what that is, you know, what that is really. This is not to say that, you know, I don't think that I wouldn't like to see more and more societies moving towards genuine democracy because, but, but I have, it's because of a moral and political commitment, you know, yes. commitment to people not being ruled by oligarchies, by elites, by tiny numbers of people. I think we could do with some, a lot of democracy in this country, and a lot of other people could do with democracies there. I think there's a genuine problem in the Middle East about the autocratic nature of the governments which have held people down for, you know, in different ways, in different countries there. So, I mean, they need a good dose of democracy, whether they need it at the, at the muzzle of an AK, 44 or, or, you know, or a Bush, uh, uh, yeah. uh, whatever, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't think, but, but that isn't to say that, do you see what I mean? That, that it's, it's a difficult yeah, question to argue. I don't think we can <coughs> march around the world and make people cosmopolitan. On the mm. other hand, you know, the more people can begin to hope and aspire in a cosmopolitan way, the the less we will be driven to ethnically cleanse people who are not like us, to mm. you know, murder people who won't convert to us, uh, you know, people who won't subscribe to the Western way of life, etc. Yeah, I mean, there are kind of countries where sort of almost miraculously democracy returns, like yes. in Spain, for yes. example, in Poland, yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. yes, I mean, <clears throat> partly because of Mandela, but and um, yes. the clerk. So, so it is possible. Yes, of course it's possible. Of for course it to possible. happen. And, yes. uh, and people but you know, South Africa in that sense, although I know it has many problems to resolve, <coughs> was extremely lucky mm. that nobody decided to impose anti-apartheid from outside. Right. <laughs> that they managed to do it for themselves and managed to do it in a way which didn't, you know, uh, uh, disable others from joining in once they'd seen the light or coming to terms with it and so on. Truly democratic. That's the product of a truly democratic conception right. of the future. You know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say it sounds very individualistic to say, you know, Mandela and Leclerc, you know, yeah. managed it. But unless you have, unless you're leading in that direction, things will take the opposite direction because they seem yeah. to me to be driving you towards 
and battling the differences or requiring homogenization rather than an mm. openness, a critical openness to others, you know, as a, as a facilitating the discourse of critical openness to others, which doesn't mean saying, you know, everything that other people do is right. I mean, it means saying where you think, you know, in this sense, I'm child of the Enlightenment. I think the one good thing the Enlightenment did understand was it required, you know, a big argument. <laughs> it required right. a row. It required a lot of talking, a lot of polemical pamphlets against your opponent. You know, not stabbing them in the street, but it required an argument. You know, I mm. think democracy is, is, is not... People talk about the, you know, stability of democracy. Democracy is an open, argumentative, you know, quarrelsome society. It's quarrels that created, uh, you know, the enfranchisement of women, or that gave the majority of people the vote. It's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's struggles that <laughs> that democratized right. old aristocratic and industrial capitalist societies, etc. So, uh, it's not an easy passage. But you know, uh, 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 translate this your question to another site. Should we teach cosmopolitan values in schools? And, you know, uh, without labelling it that, I would say, yes, uh, um, it's time uh, the cultural curriculum of schools, and of course all schools are passing on culture as well as knowledge and scientific understanding and so on, they're transmitting a culture. And the more we consciously think about whether we are transmitting the values of critical openness, you know, of uh, respect for but not subservience to difference, of a democratic culture, of, you know, questioning. Uh, we're in the middle of a row about, uh, about selling uh, um, peerages. You know. I see those faces, those ten faces that contributed to the Labour Party in my paper yesterday. Will anybody ask the question, why should I be governed by these people? You know, I wouldn't trust them to teach my grandchild across the road. Yeah, but nobody asked that question. So I mean, a democratic culture is really questioning, you know, why are they in positions of power? Why should somebody at the top, name some of them, because they're very wealthy, to shape the laws that govern me and my life and the life of my grandchildren to come? Uh, this is a, you know, I think if we're going to be free enough to teach creationism and that kind of rubbish in schools, we ought to be teaching a cosmopolitan curriculum. Because, after all, Britain has become, whether it likes it or not, a kind of proto-cosmopolitan society. Whether we're going to get rid of multiculturalism as a term or not, we are in f effect a kind of mixed up multicultural society. Not a multicultural society, although we could become one, in which the different groups patrol the differences and the boundaries between them, but a kind of mixture of cultures and histories and languages and traditions and cuisines and ways of life. That's what Britain now is, for good or not. And to have a curriculum which doesn't teach the underpinning values, the positive, a positive view of that kind of cosmopolitan mixed is to sell the past, but we will, you know, fall back into ethnic particularism. So you are cosmopolitan in your own country, <laughs> <laughs> in a way. Well, that's yeah. nice to think yeah. of. But I sort of am a cosmopolitan without thinking about it. Yes. Well, Stuart Hall, thank you very, very much for sharing your thoughts with us.